Welcome to episode 15 of the Sports Geek Podcast. In this episode, we chat to the guys behind FanCam, look at athletes getting hacked and the changing focus of sports digital teams. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. Now, here's your host, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. My name is Sean Callanan from Sports Geek, and you're listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. This is episode 15. You can get all the show notes and links to this episode at sportsgeekhq.com slash 15. Thanks again for all the feedback to the Seat Podcasts both episode 13 with my interview, my presentation with Philippe Dorr from NASCAR and then also the mega interview podcast last week with episode 14. Um, we actually do finish off the last of our set interviews today speaking to Tinnis LaRue from FanCam and Kylie Kaflish. Um, and then we get back into the swing of things with a few segments on Grandstand looking at the a few athletes getting their social accounts hacked, how they could have prevented it and how you can prevent protect your own social accounts both personally and for your team Um, and then we look at the changing focus of sports digital teams just a bit of a look back over the last few years and now what teams are looking to but first here's my interview with Tinnis LaRue from FanCam Here we are final final day of seat Um, everyone's starting to go there's a tour for Sporting Park soon, so we're just trying to uh, get a few interviews. And I'm here joined by Tinnis, and I'm going to. I, I knew I was going to get you. Tinnis from FanCam, and you, I'm going to get you to say your name because I don't want to. I don't want to muck it up. Tinnis Larue. 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 Apologies for not getting uh, for not getting that right. And uh, you you came in on Monday and you did the the mini FanCam. Yeah, it was as a. Um, we, we we spent some time all, all week, but we had the opportunity to. Um, capture the audience yep. um, with our technology um, which is kind of cool seems like they liked it and it's a great opportunity to show people what it's about so for the people who don't know about uh, fan cam one tell us where they can find it and what it is okay so um, it is a visual product so it is best that you access a website if you if you close the computer it's fancam.com yep um, so that's easy enough what it is is um, we figured out how to take gigapixel images very fast a gigapixel image that start with that is a high resolution image um, normally or to give you an idea of the size of these things um, if we print it out as a billboard it would be two football fields in length so it, it allows us basically to capture everyone in the stadium face level detail so you know at the conference you pretty much uh, James Taylor got up the front took the click 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 yeah. um, around the around and it took 15, 20 seconds around about that? Yeah, it's it's a relatively fast process, but basically it's a composite image, so it's like building a puzzle. So James would take, and depending on what the scenario is, um, it, the technique differs from the MCG to a, a small co- conference room, but we have different recipes, if you like, um, of how to capture these images, and then there's a team back um, in Cape Town that know how to put them together so we call it stitching yep. and, and to, to make that a seamless whole that, that, so in the thing. end and yeah, I'll, sh- I'll share the show links of, of the SEAT conference mini fan cam but I'll also share some uh, I think you're sharing one from the Stanley Cup yeah. um, you, you, there's a bit of a you got, must have a bit of a stadium bucket list uh, of a uh, number of, <laughs> yeah, number of I, venues I'm, you've been to. Do you have you kept count? Well, like how many I, I have venues been, have you I, been to? I do the boarding stuff, so so I, I'm, 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 I spend time in the back office. James is, has a more impressive list there, but but we've been lucky um, because we were were first to basically understand how to monetize the content. Um, stadiums include Bird's Nest in China. Recently did. Um, uh, Championship League final in, in, in London, um, Stanley Cup. It's the second year we've done that. We've done 18, uh, for 18T, we did the NCAA finals a few times. And yeah, so we've got a nice list of, of places. So I want to get into that campaign side of things because yeah. I, because I, I, first of all, I must apologize that I did not get you guys into my, uh, my presentation because one of the key things was of the, that, that Philippe and I were looking at was a campaign that is killer content that provides engagement and gets data. And your fan cams tick all of those three three boxes because you end up with this very rich, content-rich site, you know, 95,000 people, and you can see every single person. Um, it provides engagement because people want to find themselves 
tag themselves, tag their friends, um, and obviously, you know, the holy grail of, of the CRM guys is to get the data. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you've even, I haven't yet tagged, gone and tagged myself on, on the seat one, but I will. And you can, they can tag themselves on with Facebook and Twitter and, and LinkedIn. It's Anything a, we choose. I mean, we, when we're in, in China, we, we've integrated QQ and Sina. We just did um, uh, activation for Red Bull in, in Moscow, where we integrated v, v Contacte, which is the, their social platform. So, um, yeah, we can capture a lot of data through that way. And um, so you were talking quickly there about some of the stadiums you've done and from the monetization point of view, who, who are the people that are one wanting this the most and how and how are teams or stadiums making some money out of it? Yeah, so, so um, I'm going to take one step back. Um, you spoke about content and data um, and, and we do um, hit, hit all the boxes there. The reason we do is because it's fan-centric. As you know, it's really difficult to give fans, a, if you're a brand, to make either a funny campaign or a cool campaign. Oh, yeah. To that, what, you mean you can't just have, oh, complete, we please have a viral video? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that's the best brief. So, so, so where we're, um, and, and it's because of the nature of the product more than to the design of it, it's, it's focused on each and every fan. I mean, I need to stop. Oh, no, it's still recording. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. That was a technical hitch, and apologies for that. Um, I might edit it out, or we might just keep it because that's the live live podcast. Okay, so apologies for, no, my, for, for, for so, doing that. So if I, um, so, back to the fact that it's fan centric. So we create content that's actually customized content because if you zoom into your face, that's the that's the center of your universe, um, and everything else gives context. I experience something completely different because I'm in a different part of the crowd. So it's like the case where. You open the world map when you're in Australia, then Australia is the center of the universe, and when I'm in South Africa, it's there. And same thing. So we're we're lucky there in that the content is fan centric. That allows us the data. That allows us the, um, the the engagement and everything that comes with it. Go to sportsgeekhq.com for more sports digital marketing resources. And we're back with Tennis from FanCam. Um, we were talking before about uh, how to monetize it and how to monetize FanCam because that's so, yeah, everyone's looking to do a digital campaign, but like, how do we pay for it? That, yeah, that, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I think, look, we have clients in in rights holders, clients in sponsors. Sometimes it's an agency. Um, mostly, it's a brand because brands are looking for digital content and targeted digital content. Um, you spoke about the Holy Grail earlier. Um, so brands end up paying for this, but it might be through a team. So we'll work with teams and help them to understand um, how to incorporate the fan cam into their offering to brands. Um, because one of the, the strengths is that it helps with integrated marketing campaigns. If you already have a, a video that you want to promote, you've already spent money on, then we put that on the big screen. If you've already paid for signage rights within a stadium um, and on the LEDs, we change the LEDs to only have Coca-Cola's name there. Um, so it gives the brand a better ROI and it allows the team, when they sell onto the brand, to close the marketing loop. So um, although we work with teams, it would be f- to help them mostly to sell it on. Um, in other cases, we work with agencies who already sit with those budgets and, uh, and rights to activate it. So when you take photos of 70,000, 80,000, 95,000 people, surely, and you know, and I've, I've heard actually uh, uh, Will Anderson talk about being at sports venues in, a, in, in the US and how they always have kiss cam and, yeah. and, uh, and it doesn't happen as much as in Australia because in Australia... Um, a guy will just drop his strides and do a brown eye. Yeah. Uh, right? And then do something inappropriate. Now, you've taken shots of thousands and thousands of people. I'm sure you've got some where they go, hey, we're taking a shot, get ready. And you, you've had to uh, do some a pretty nifty shot, uh, Photoshop work in some parts yeah. of the crowd. Yeah. The, the guys in the back office, I've seen some interesting stuff. Um, the, the, there's, there's one piece of data that I find really interesting. Um, we, we captured, I think I mentioned earlier, um, all 24 um, US dates of the U2 360 tour. Um, which is, was appropriately named. Um, and I think there's a million fans we captured there. We, we had one guy that, that flicked us the bird. 
um, as you'll say, say down under. And then, and then we, we did a sevens game um, in Australia, I think South Coast. Oh, well, they're, they're, that's a party atmosphere, so, and that's pretty crazy, so the you, sevens. You had, you, our ratio for, for, for that was one in a million in, in the US, and out of the 15,000 fans, I think we had to remove the middle finger of 98 um, um, individuals. So you have a lot of um, really excited Australian guys on the photo, um, Throwing their fists up at the <laughs> because the, obviously the, the paid customers didn't want the, want, want, want the bird in there. So it, it is different um, in different cultures, but um, that's what that's why we have the, the Photoshop so, guys. So the last thing, um, I believe this is your first time at Seed Conference. Yeah. Uh, one, how have you found it, and what have been your your key takeaways from the conference? I found it really interesting because. Um, uh, I sat and just tried to learn, understand what 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 are the problems that the CRM guys face, um, what digital activation guys, um, and data is, and, and Wi-Fi has been the, the two words running around. Um, I'm not sure if, if if how many people know how to implement either, um, uh, and that's going to be interesting. So I'm I'm a bit worried that there might be too many buzzwords. Um, there, there have been a few really good panelists that really cut to the core saying, right, there are lots. So let's take the digital activation stuff. Cool is cool, but um, tying that into revenue, there, there's a gap there. So I think there's, there's, there's a space for um, in the industry for a lot of common sense. Um, I think people are starting to find their feet. Um, they're not just jumping from one platform to the other. Yeah, um, the latest they, bright and shiny thing. Yeah, and I, th- and I think... Uh, you, you, you hear words like roadmap um, a lot. I think that we're starting to see some principles being distilled and saying, and they're surprisingly old principles. Um, what is value? Why are fans at sporting events? Why are they at, um, in our case, live music events? The reasons are, <laughs> are the same. Um, be it a Mos- event in Moscow or a... Um, Sasquatch Festival, music festival up in in, in, um, in Washington, and I think articulating those reasons why people engage, why do they gather together around a a band or a a, a team? If you understand that, then um, digital activation comes naturally, and um, making decisions about CRM and what the value of data is becomes easier. And I'm starting to see. Um, just as a, as a bit of an outsider or um, I don't have skin in the game with CRM and stuff like that um, I'm starting to see more clarity in the market guys not running around saying ooh these features those features um, this activation Instagram now Vine there um, it's more principled discussion which is really good news well thank you very much for, for joining us uh, where can people find you on Twitter what's your Twitter handle um, I am Tinus LaRue T-I-N-U-S-L-E R O U X um, um, and fancam.com, and, and we'll put the link for the seat uh, 2013 mini fancam.com cam. Fancam.com is a good place, and I'll make sure that the seat is um, one is up there as well. Um, and that's a good place to get basic overview of what the technology is. Um, but we've got 120 um, examples up there. And I look forward to uh, seeing you in New York next year for yeah. seat 2014. I've already booked the tickets. All right. Thanks for joining me. It's a great pleasure, man. Find all Sports Geek podcasts at sportsgeekhq.com slash SGP. Thanks again to Tennis LaRue from FanCam for joining me on the last day of seat. Um, technical difficulties with standing. We got through it. Um, and check out uh, cconference.fancam.com to see everyone who went to the conference. Uh, a fair few of the attendees have have tagged themselves, just proving the point of what Tennis was saying that uh, provides the engagement and also provides the data. Um, on my return from the US, uh, there was a bit of a social media storm in the world of AFL where a few AFL players were targeted by hackers and had their accounts hacked um, in quite a high-profile way. Um, they sent out a few obtuse tweets and a few uh, weird Instagrams um, caused a bit of a, a ruckus but obviously it was not done by the players themselves so on ABC Grandstand I discussed with Francis Leach on how they could have prevented it and the importance of securing your social identity Set 
Friday morning, Francis Leach with you. We like to spend a bit of time with our good friend Sean Callanan, the digital sports guru from Sports Geek HQ each week to talk about sport in the digital world. Uh, he's with us here this morning via the telephone, the old-fashioned technology. G'day, Sean. How are you going? I'm good, thanks, Francis. And yourself? I'm good. My account uh, on Twitter hasn't been hacked this week, which makes me in the minority. There's been a lot of that going on lately. Tell us about who's been copying it. Yeah, there was a, there was a few that copped it this week. Uh, first, it was uh, Buddy Franklin's Instagram that uh, was there was hacks saying see you later Hawks I'm going to the Giants. Um, uh, imagine right. if he, just why could you stop it down for a sec? Imagine if that's how he announced it with a meme. He just yeah. said see you later with a big hand waving. That would yeah, be the first, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. But uh, you know the fact that it had the hashtag money over loyalty uh, <laughs> and the thing you could sort of see that it was a it was either just a bit of a cruel joke by Buddy or, or that his account had been hacked. And then, yeah, it was a, there was a bit of a spate of it. Uh, a few of the AFL footballers were targeted. Uh, Dale Thomas from Collingwood had his Twitter hacked. Um, Jack Rewalt had his Instagram hacked as well. So there was a few others. Um, so there was a bit of scrambling at, in the media and comms department and a few of the AFL teams to say, uh, come on, boys, you've got to uh, protect, your, protect your accounts a little bit better. Now, how do you do that? Well, so the first, the first one, the easiest one that to to do some protection with is actually is actually Twitter. Um, it offers what they call uh, two-factor authentication. If I can get into full geek mode, um, it allows you to uh, register your mobile phone and have Twitter send you an SMS to verify that it's really you. And if anyone tries to change your password and that kind of thing, it'll actually notify your mobile. So it's a far more secure way of. Um, securing your Twitter account than just uh, your username and your password. But uh, so that's one way that you can definitely lock down uh, your Twitter account. Instagram, unfortunately, doesn't have two-factor authentication, I should say. Um, Twitter just uh, brought it in um, because they had the, uh, I think it was the New York Times was hacked uh, recently and, and put up a post and caused a bit of a, uh, cause a bit of a furor because people thought it was actually news. So no, and it, it can be very serious, and we've seen this in the markets in the past, where tweets from I think there was a, a, a false tweet that came out of uh, the uh, out of Wall Street in New York last year, which caused a huge uh, run on a particular stock on Wall Street, and a lot of money was lost. And there was an investigation into insider trading to see whether somebody had uh, manipulated the market by sending out a false tweet in order to uh, you know be ahead of the game and cash in. Yeah, and, that, and that's pretty much why Twitter has sort of bumped up their security with the two factor. Um, yeah, so it remains to be seen whether Instagram and 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 Facebook uh, do the same. You can register, you can register with uh, you know your mobile phone with with Facebook as well. I mean, but the primary thing is is uh, to make sure that your password is a is a strong password. So pass, um, being able to sort of d- decipher and break down people's passwords is something that, that people spend a lot of time doing. So it's uh, it's not a guessing game. There's a, probably a sort of black art to doing it. Yeah. Um, so the main thing is uh, you've got to make sure that if, you know, whatever password strategy you're going to use, it's a, it's a smart and uh, strong password. I mean, there was there was a there was a meme after Buddy's was hacked was uh, the hashtag Buddy's password and you know Buddy twenty three won't cut it anymore, um, and most likely that's what happened. It was just a brute force strength attack on their Instagram accounts, and the idea is uh, you know you can just keep pummeling away until until you get the right right password. So from a protection point of view, they want to make sure they've got different passwords passwords for everything. They want to really review what apps. Uh, they've connected their Twitter and Instagram accounts with. Like if they've got, uh, connected with a dodgy app, that might get access to their password. And if they're using the same password on Instagram and Twitter and, you know, God forbid, their, their internet banking as well, um, that just opens up their whole identity. So are you suggesting also that people maybe think about changing their passwords regularly? Oh, it does make, it does make good sense because, uh, you, you know, you never know what app you might connect with or... Um, that might that might compromise your account, um, but yeah, definitely if you have it, have something that uh, can make give you a nice long strong password, usually you'll be fine. And then just be very wary of of clicking on uh, suspicious links that might get access to your account. But you know what might also be the case in in this case for from a footballer's point of view is simple things like just having a lock on your phone. Um, you know, this could have all just started by, you know, one of their mates going, oh, this is funny, I've got his phone, let's see what we can do. So, you know, that 
for all the uh, technical hacking there might be, it might be just some some someone fortuitously uh, getting your phone and sending out a tweet. So you can secure it as much as you can, but uh, yeah, you've just got to make sure that you know it's going to affect affect your brand potentially as a as a footballer. I mean, these days the uh, my account got hacked. Is the uh, you know the dog ate my homework? As you knew, I've been quoted out of context. There's no doubt yeah. about it. Good on you, Sean. Good to talk to you, and uh, thanks for the heads up on that. And I'll be uh, spending all afternoon changing my passwords. Cheers, mate. Go to sportsgeekhq.com for more sports digital marketing resources. So, just following up on how to best secure your social profiles um, as I said on the spot with on ABC Grandstand um, the two-factor authentication works quite well with Twitter um, on Facebook it doesn't have two-factor it actually calls it login approvals so the same process is that uh, you can put in your mobile number and it will send you a code uh, to verify that you're actually logging in um, as I said makes complete sense another thing that uh, didn't get to and has happened before is when you are looking to potentially move someone on or you're, someone's leaving your organisation um, and as far as changing your passwords that doesn't actually get someone doesn't kick someone off if they're already logged in with the Twitter app on um, iOS so what you actually have to do is to effectively obliterate all devices uh, that are connected to your Twitter account if you want to really make sure that no one still has access to it um, so it's a bit of a loophole you might go and change your passwords but former employees or, or staff members you might have given it access to it at a certain point in time will continue to have access to it um, even if you do change the password. So um, there'll be links in the show notes. This sportsgeekhq.com slash 15. Um, so that was uh, the ABC Grandstand that I did just coming back from Kansas City. So I've got one more up my sleeve um, and pretty much is looking back on what seat was and also discussing it with some of the teams around the focus um, of what they are doing now. So it was a quick chat with Francis of the uh, changing nature of digital teams uh, in sports. Time to catch up with our digital sports guru from Sports Geek HQ, Sean Kellen, and he's returned from the States from the uh, big digital sport conference seat uh, and slowly recovering from the Achilles injury. He's probably going to keep him out of the finals campaign. G'day, Sean. How are you going? I'm um, good. Thanks, Francis. How was it this time? I mean, this is a conference. How many years has the SEAT Digital Sport Conference been running? Um, so it's been going for seven years. Um, and like I said, I first went on in 2011. And in the last two years, it's it's changed in uh, from its origins of a sports tech uh, CEO, CTO uh, space to uh, adding two streams for the sports CRM side of things. Which is, uh, the, which uh, is the customer th- relations uh, management. And uh, un- understanding your fan and the 360 view of your fan. Um, and then also the, the, digital, uh, the digital guys and, and engagement and campaigns and things like that. So, you know, it sort of gave me a bit of uh, time to pause and sort of reflect on like from a digital point of view, how the teams have changed, both over the time of seat, but just over you know the time of Sports Geek. When I started Sports Geek, I was uh, banging the digital drum of telling people they needed a Sports Geek and why they needed to build these digital teams to to engage the fan. Um, and now you can sort of see that uh, those teams have you know grown um, uh, and built up their skills in delivering delivering content first from a point of view of you know social and and just web writing content uh, been a big growth in video so there's been a lot of uh, upskilling and uh, up and increasing their resources in video because that's what the fans are wanting um, and now we're sort of seeing and always that's been tried to sort of integrated with sponsors and things like that but now both uh, the sponsors and the teams are realizing well digital is a really big part of it um, you know, from a sports sponsorship point of view, you've got that uh, brand recognition and you're an association with the brand. So, you know, with it's a jersey sponsorship, a shirt sponsorship, signage at the game, um, you know, and that's great. The signage at the game in, engages the fans that are at the at the game. Um, you do game activations, which you, which the teams in the states do really, really, really well. What sort of ones have you seen there that really have been successful? I know the Oakland A's did some good ones in the past. Haven't they? They're sort of past masters at because it's so many fixtures. Like you might have eighty home games a year or thereabouts. So you've got to find a different angle. You can't do it every game, but a different theme or, or a different take on things to to make it a special event, a standalone event amongst the eighty other games that well, are going to be played. Yeah, exactly. Like, 
when we had uh, Travis LaDolce from the A's and he was talking about an, 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 a Category A and a Category B giveaway um, with bobbleheads and, and the garden gnomes that they did. One, just to, just to drive more fans in, give them another incentive, but but also doing things with it, with your sponsors at the game. Um, but the thing is, you can only engage, you know, those are, one, great because you're getting that uh, one-on-one, you know, a real life connection with fans but you're only connecting with the fans of the stadium so what digital offers is it allows you to connect with the people outside the stadium um, which is a large bigger uh, you know a larger audience so now what we're seeing is that the team's focus is sort of uh, moving from, oh, I want to engage our fans and I want our fans to consume and, you know, I want to build up a, a digital property that's worth worth visiting to how can we position our content and build content that is monetizable and, and make money from. Which is a difficult transition because fans come to it in an act of trust because they believe what's being written is there for them and to facilitate their love of the club. If they feel like they're being impinged upon to further cough up cash, it changes that relationship fundamentally. Yeah, you, I mean, you can't, uh, you can't be always you know, hitting up your fans f- for money. So that's, you know, that's where sponsors play in the, in the world of sport. And so, you know, so how can uh, the content that is produced by sports teams you know, be in line with other commercial content. Um, I was watching Media Watch um, via replay. Uh, Paul Barry did a whole thing on content marketing and branded content and how sponsors are being integrated into content into newspapers and news on, on the commercial so networks. So the, the line between and editorial and advertising is con- constantly being shift is shifting and blurred. Yeah, it is being blurred. So it's you know, so I'm not talking about that we're going to start seeing rugby teams talking about you know prices going down in supermarkets. And I don't you know I don't think we're going to go down that, that down that path that much. But you know how can uh, sports teams integrate sponsors and uh, in their content without it being you know clunky and um, not as cohesive as as they'd like, because um, the thing is they have got premium they have got premium content that fans do like. They you know they are going to watch the video that announces the team. They are going to watch a video that you know gives them ins and outs of of how how you know someone's knee is coming along. So they are going to watch that. So how can they um, better integrate the the sponsor um, and let the sponsor get some of that referred love? Um, of the team in the same way that that's why they're on the they're on the jersey. So there's a bit of a brand awareness play. But then there's also um, that CRM side of oh, I'm a sponsor and I want to target a certain t- style of fan to to buy a car or or to build a new house or they're looking to renovate. You know how can we look at our data and present that offer uh, back to the fan and make sure we're, we're targeting that fan and providing value back to the fan. I mean that's what the sports team needs to do. They need to provide value back to the fan so they they feel like in, uh, feeling that they're giving the fan some value um, and rewarding them for being part of their community, part of their tribe. So that's that's where this you know we're seeing now that the sports teams are moving from you know just pure content engagement guys to having a bit more of a commercial hat on and saying, well, if we're going to build a a video series, if we're going to build a podcast, if we're going to build an article series, we're going to get into feature writer. How can we? You know, and it might be as simple as you know slapping a sponsor and saying this is brought to you by that kind of thing. But you know, how can we get more innovative? Um, how can we work with sponsors that are really active in the social space? You know, we're active in the social space, so how can we work with their campaigns um, and you know be aligned with you know what our goals are from a brand point of view and see if they can align with what our sponsors are doing? Who's doing it here? What the best you think in Australia? Um, I think it's um, it's a bit it's a bit hit and miss. Um, you know. Because a lot of it, a lot of it comes down, and this is where the digital teams are changing. You know, a sponsorship will happen, and you know, the uh, naming rights, and and it's you know, the sponsorship guys do a great job to land the sponsor. And at the moment, and this is the same frustration that guys in the states are having. That oh, then can we do some digital with these guys? And it's and it's sort of going. Oh, we'll do it because they're our our sponsor. Whereas what we're seeing now, and this is the discussion that the guys in the states are having, are saying, well, when the sponsorship guys are getting in the discussion of how we're going to activate, they bring the digital guys in a little bit earlier and have them talk to the right people, so you can, you know, have it have it fully integrated across. So. Um, you know, it's it's tough. Sometimes the sponsor marries up really well with the with the team, and it can work really well. Um, but it's more of a luck at the minute than than. <laughs> 
and planning to a certain degree. Everyone's just trying to keep pace with all the changes. Where can people find you uh, in the digital space? Uh, SportsGeekHQ.com or uh, Sean Callanan or SportsGeek. Good on you, Sean. Thanks for coming in. Sean Callanan, our sports uh, digital guru here on Grandstand Breakfast each Saturday morning. We'll catch him again next week. Like the Sports Geek Podcast? Find us on Facebook.com slash Sports Geek. What do you think about the changes in sports teams? Um, have you seen the change from developing content, engaging fans, now moving more into that commercialization model? Obviously, we've all been doing the commercialization for the last couple of years, but um, I definitely see one, the digital is becoming really in focus on the commercialization and getting to the point of that branded content, integrated campaigns to make sure that the sponsors are happy. Um, we can't do those standalone uh, sponsor activations that don't connect back to both uh, the, the fans but also your content because we that is what is being consumed so just definitely a shift especially around the the fact that the digital guys are starting to work a bit more closely with the with the sponsorship guys and uh, bring in earlier in the process around developing campaigns around what the sponsor wants but also what you can deliver um, one last interview for this episode is one from um, we spoke to BJ and Colin last week from Team Black Shirts. So we've got one more interview with another one of the fine members of Team Black Shirts, Kylie Keflish. Okay, here I am at uh, seat conference, just checking the levels. I'm here with Kylie Kaflish. How are you doing, Kylie? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. And how have you? You have been interning here at uh, seat conference. How have you found it? I love it. Absolutely love it. And uh, you know, as an intern and looking for your way to get into the sports business market, mm-hmm. um, have you done a bit of networking and met some really great people? I've met a vast amount of people, and it's amazing how what great connections you can really meet here it's not just one person it's, it's a variety of people and uh, you know tell us what you've been doing where have you been where have you been going to college um, I go, I'm from Louisiana I go to Southeastern and um, I'm graduating actually in December in sports management well congratulations on graduating <laughs> thank you and I know we was talking to you earlier because of an exciting uh, placement where you're heading off soon ah uh, yes I just got an internship actually with um the New Orleans Saints. I'm actually the first from my school to get an internship with an NFL. Oh, ter- terrific. Do you know what that role will be? Um, I'll be working a lot with the players, um, the youth coordinator. So um, I'll be doing the whole play 60, you know, trying to influence kids with um, fitness. Okay. And also working with the players to do that. Ter- terrific. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll be tweeting your story as you develop oh, your work in the, in the uh, sports business. Um, and you're, I'm, I'm sure, as you've already done with me, you'll be connecting with everyone here on LinkedIn. I'm hoping, yes, sir. And your Twitter handle is for everyone who's listening? It's just Kylie Kaflish. All right, we'll have that in the show notes. Thank you very much, Kyla, for coming on. Thank you, Sean. You're listening to Sports Geek Podcast. Send us a tweet to at Sports Geek. That's it for another Sports Geek Podcast. Thanks again for joining me. My name is Sean Callanan. You can find me at Sean Callanan. You can get the show notes for this podcast and get the Twitter IDs and LinkedIn pages for the people who are on the show. Thank you for tennis and Kylie for being on the show. You can get the show notes at sportsgeekhq.com slash 15. And you can find all Sports Geek podcasts now, 15 episodes. is a stack of content. I um, really appreciate the people who are sharing it on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, if you could leave a note, um, a review on iTunes, that would really help. I'll leave the links in the show notes to the US, UK, and Australian iTunes store. All the ratings actually do separate, so it's really important that you could leave a review on on wherever you are. Um, I'll leave you uh, with some noise from the MCG, the crowd, the sounds of the game uh, from the MCG. Um, I'm luckily now no longer using crutches. I've still got the moon boot, but I'm able to walk to the MCG. Luckily, I live that close, and so this just uh, was really music to my ears. Uh, this is the sound of the crowd cheering off the teams at half time and then appropriately booing the umpires. Until next week, my name is Sean Callanan. Don't be shy. Send me a tweet. Cheers.
please leave a review on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. Thanks for listening to the Sports Geek Podcast.